All right, it's going to be an incredible week we're going to have together. It starts Friday night. There are nine shows. We get all six campuses to join together, and uh, we're a part of this amazing week that is the Christmas week. I hope you'll participate with Wonder. Bring somebody with you. Um, we're also excited. You know, we're a regional church, one church in six locations, and I just want to say how much I enjoy that. I love being able to be a part of something God's doing all over the region. Every campus is going to have its own Christmas Eve experiences. Of course, the Hampton campus is hosting the Wonder on that night, but it's going to be an awesome thing. And one of the things we're going to do during the Wonder events is we're going to highlight one of our Kingdom Builder giving projects, which is, I think, one of the most compelling, and that has to do with uh, Global Families Daughter Project, which has homes all over the, the world, now Scotland, also in Asia primarily, that helps to rescue people who are caught in trafficking. And so we're going to highlight that and give toward that. And we're aiming towards this Kingdom Builder goal this year of one2 Five million dollars to give towards projects all around the world. The good news is this past week we crossed the one million dollar mark. So praise God for that. Good job, guys. Uh, we're still a ways to go. You can see sort of the graphic there. Uh, we got a ways to go between now and the end of the year, but we're believing in faith that we're going to hit that target and that especially we'll be able to fund some really good things like what's happening with the Daughter Project. So uh, just why don't you just turn to your neighbor where you are and just, just say, I just can't wait for Christmas. Just tell him that right now. I, it's going to be awesome this year. Awesome stuff. Yeah, so glad you joined us at Allison Park Church today. Okay, if you haven't met me, my name's Jeff Leak. I'm the lead pastor here at Allison Park, and I, I have been here quite a long time. And uh, we're going to finish the series we started a couple weeks ago called Viral Change. And we'll start with this concept. So we're going to really connect to what we just talked about with the Wonder event. But let's just start with this. So what do you think about Kanye? Huh? How about that? That's pretty incredible. Now, now I know that's a very loaded question because there's a lot of controversy about Kanye West. You say, well, Pastor Jeff, who is Kanye West? Well, not that I'm the expert. But uh, from what I understand, he is an artist, rapper, philosopher, politician, uh, influencer, Celebrity, I mean, he just got a whole lot of titles to his name, married, of course, to Kim Kardashian, and just recently made a public confession that he's a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, that brought with it a lot of questions because people are saying, well, what's his agenda? And is it a genuine conversion? And how do we know what he really believes? And what should we feel about such things? And I'll just tell you my first reaction is, I think it's awesome. I think it's incredible, right? Anytime anybody steps up and says, I want to follow Jesus Christ, I'm cheering for him. I am not going to judge him or draw any conclusions about what's going to happen. You say, but yeah, Pastor Jeff, you know, I grew up in an era. I remember when Bob Dylan became a Christian, and then he didn't necessarily stick with it. But while he was, it was incredible, you know. Johnny Cash, the country singer, had his little moment. You know, I'm, I'm not sure where he ended up. You know, I even remember as a kid, I was telling my wife this, uh, Terry Bradshaw actually came out with his own... In the 1970s, country music Christian album. How about that right there? And so, you know, Terry, everybody's imperfect in their journey of faith, but, but I'm just cheering. You know, Jesus, one, there was this one moment, Mark chapter 9 records it, where the disciples saw someone casting out demons that wasn't from their clan, and they say, should we stop him? And Jesus says, why would we stop him? If he's not against us, he's for us. And anybody that does a miracle in my name, how could he talk bad against me? Right, so let's cheer. This is an awesome thing. It's incredible to see. If you've heard his, his you know, new recording, I think it's amazing. He, his, he last, I think, was on Osteen a couple of weeks ago, kind of sharing his story. Anytime somebody of that profile um, becomes an influence for Christ, I think it's an awesome thing. Now, I know I'm bragging on Kanye. You say, when are you going to be done with that? Okay, let me just tell you this. There are these moments in time when somebody has a profound conversion experience and where they become a public figure and they talk about it. But it's not just the public figure's conversion experiences that are important. It's anybody that comes to Christ has a sphere of influence that they affect, right? No matter who you are, where you come from, at the moment you find Jesus and he starts to affect your life, the people who know you are like, well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> what do I think? You know, I know where they came from. I know what they've been into. I know their past. Is this really genuine? Is it a little legit? But, but when a person really does experience a life change that comes from meeting Jesus Christ, there is some factors that I think are important that we need to trace back and measure. Somebody, somewhere, had to invite Kanye West into a conversation about Christ. In anybody's spiritual journey, no matter who they are or where they've come from, somebody someplace 
had to at some point say, hey, you should consider the person of Christ and the kind of impact that he can have on your life. Now, I actually know a couple of the people that influenced Kanye's conversation. Um, I'm good friends with a pastor from Miami, Florida, Rich Wilkerson, and his son, Rich Wilkerson Jr., is also a significant pastor now, actually had a relationship with Kanye and Kim and performed their wedding ceremony. I mean, that was the ceremony to be invited to right there, right? It's like royalty. Come on. I mean, wow. And he was the one performing the ceremony. And then there's a guy. He actually is leading the Bible study that Kanye West is in in California. His name is Adam Tyson. And he's had very specific, frank conversations with him about matters of faith. And somewhere behind the scenes of anyone's conversion experience, there is always somebody who's involved in having an influence of conversation. Now, let's jump from there to say this. Here's the main idea of the message today, viral change. We're saying, you know, something small when shared can make a huge difference. Here's the idea. One simple invitation can change the world. <laughs> Isn't that true? It, one, just one ask, just one moment of saying, hey, would you consider this has the ability to change the world? Why don't you say that out loud with me? Everybody say now, one simple invitation can change the world. Just, just by making the invitation to consider something. It, it's the conversation that leads to another conversation that might lead a person to a place where they finally say, you know, I think I'm ready to give my life to Christ. And that moment is such a huge thing in your journey. You know, I grew up in a home where the primary invitations for me uh, were really not invitations. They were more commandments. <laughs> my dad didn't say, didn't say to me as a young man, would you like to go to church? He was the pastor, you see. He, he would be more like this. You're going to church, son, you know? And I'd be like, but there's stuff going on. and My friend doesn't have to. But, you know, but at some point in the journey, there were some significant people in my high school, in my youth group, older, older young men that, that, that I began to look up to and admire, and they started to spur something in, in my life that brought me to a place where I was at 15 years old willing to say, okay, I think this is for me. This is not just my daddy's faith anymore. I think this is for me. I think I want to give my life to Christ. And I tell you, the 15-year-old Jeff Leak who prayed the salvation prayer and gave his life to Jesus Christ is not the same guy. Jesus has changed me, taken away that old anger that was inside. He's given me a purpose. And there's a way that I see the world and experience life that's different because I have, I have experienced the life-changing power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. And I don't care if you come from... You know, no talent whatsoever, or you are changing the world with your celebrity influence. Everybody needs the person of Jesus Christ, and that's what we celebrate at Christmas. Can I get an amen from somebody? Yeah. All right. So, so one, let's go back to the main idea. So say it with me again. Put it on the screen. One simple invitation can change the world. Okay. Viral change. Viral change. Something small when shared makes a huge impact. This is what we've been studying in the past a uh, number of weeks together. Now, let's go into the scripture. This is actually not just a recent thing, this idea of one-on-one -on -one in impact of conversation, but it goes all the way back to the book of John. So John tells us the story of Jesus' early disciples. We're going to study there together. And uh, John chapter 1, you can put that up on the screen. This tell us, tells us how the, the followers of Christ get started, okay? And here's what it tells us. John chapter 1, verse 40 says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. So in many ways, Andrew gets the conversation started. We understand Andrew is the brother of Simon Peter, and he was a follower of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, of course, is the one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. And when Jesus comes up out of the Jordan River, he points at him and he says, this is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And a lot of those who were followers of John the Baptist chose to leave John as their, you know, the rabbi they were following, and they began to follow after Jesus. And when Andrew started to follow Jesus, he brought his brother Simon Peter along. And he, and he says... Um, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for, the one our people have been waiting for all these years. That is the Christ, it says. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter or means the rock. And the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finally, finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Okay, now he's, he's building his discipleship group. One at a time, of the 12, 
are gathering as followers of Christ, okay? Slowly they're gathering. Now, it's interesting. A lot of the ministry of Jesus begins around the Sea of Galilee, this lake in the northern part of what we know as Israel. And there was one particular village where there was five of the disciples that came from. In fact, they just discovered this this village archaeologically. They're digging it right now. It's called the village of Bethsaida. It's a little fishing town. And the five disciples that grew up there, well, Andrew, we learned him, right? He was the one that, that, was, that was the first to follow Christ. And then Simon Peter, the writer of this history of Jesus' life, John, he's also one. And his brother James, they were also part of this group, James and John. They called them the Sons of Thunder. And then there was a fifth in this city of Bethsaida. So five of the disciples from this small little town of Bethsaida. And this fifth disciple is named Philip. Everybody say Philip. Okay, so we got Andrew and Simon Peter, their brothers, and James and John and their brothers, and then we've got Philip, and all of them are following Christ, and here's what it tells us happens next. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. That's what I just told you. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, in whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he, he goes to us, he's like, okay, the clan of us here in Bethsaida, the fishing boys, the guys that grew up in this fishing town, we've all discovered Jesus and we're following him. But you know, now I got to tell my buddy Nathaniel, he, he needs to hear about this. So he goes to find Nathaniel and he tells him what he's experienced. And Nathaniel has a reaction that I think we can relate to. He says, Nazareth, what are you talking about? How can anything good come from there? Nathaniel added. So, so this is, again, often what we get whenever we begin to talk about our faith, and that's a skeptical response. Come on, what are you talking about? Nazareth, that's a hole-in-the-wall town. <laughs> that's just a place where nobody's live. Uh, nothing really is prophesied about Nazareth. I mean, come on, what are you talking about? And Philip doesn't, you know, bring the hammer down and force him to believe. He just simply makes an appeal. He says, come on, check it out with me. Come and see, Philip said. And when Peter saw Nathaniel approaching, excuse me, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said to him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. Can you see this picture now? Philip and Nathaniel have this conversation. You got to check this guy out. I'm telling you, man, something different about him. Nazareth, what are you talking about? Why would we think that the Messiah comes from Nazareth? Have you not studied your Old Testament? Come on, that's not the way it works. No, you got just just come check it out. Would you just just for a minute? Would you just come see? And so they begin to walk, and they meet Jesus. And Jesus says, "Hey, look, there's a man of integrity." And and Nathaniel had to straighten up, like. What are you talking about? We've never met. Do you know? Is this kind of set up? Is this, you know, you know how good salesmen, they, they, they sort of, they say some kind things about you before they, they begin to make their pitch. Is this, what is, what's going on here? What are you talking about? And the verse then goes on to say, how do you know me? Nathaniel asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God the king of Israel. That's kind of a strange response, isn't that? We'll come back to that in just a minute. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You'll see even greater things than that. And then he added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And Nathaniel begins to follow Christ. Okay. Let's talk about some things we learn out of this particular passage. We said, number one, the very first idea, or the main idea of the message is this, that one invitation can change the world, right? Here we see this invitation that Philip makes to Nathaniel, who most scholars believe is also called Bartholomew, becomes one of the 12 disciples, becomes one of the world changers that goes out and makes a difference in the world. And Philip makes this invitation to Nathaniel, and there's a couple of observations that we'll make about this whole concept of invitation. Here's the first. Number one, first in, uh, idea is this. Say this out loud with me. God is talking to people before I ever say a word. Okay, if you think, okay, I'm going to, uh, maybe, maybe, you know, okay, it's wonders happen in this coming week. Maybe I should bring somebody with me. Or at the, I, you know, I love our campus Christmas Eve services. It's such a great time. Maybe, maybe I should, maybe we should bring our neighbor or our coworker or somebody, man, you know, there's a possibility. Okay. Sometimes there is a pressure that we feel when it comes to personal evangelism, because we feel like maybe we need to do more than what God is really asking us to do. And sometimes I think it's that we, maybe times, at times we think that we have to do something that God is not already doing. And, and, and here's, here's what I want to remind you of in this particular story. Jesus meets Nathaniel and he says to him, 
Look, bro, I saw you when you were standing under the fig tree before Philip even came to you. And, and as soon as he says that to him, Nathaniel has this aha moment. And he's like, wow, you must be the son of God. Now, what is that about? Just to say, hey, I saw you were, you were standing under that neon sign over there. Wow, you must be the son of God. That's not the typical reaction, right? See, here's what was going on. What was happening was Nathaniel was standing there under the fig tree, and he was having his own personal moment with God. He may have been voicing some questions to God. He may have been just saying, God, if you're really there, if you're really going to send the Messiah, if you really have a purpose for my life, God, I need you to show up in my world, and I need you to speak to me. And so there was this key moment that he's having underneath the fig tree. And whenever Jesus shows up in Nathaniel's life, he says, look, I know about what was going on right there. I know what you were saying to God. I know what's in your heart. I know what the questions are that you have in your mind. And I'm here to tell you that God has an answer for your life. You see, when you step into a situation and you give voice to something on behalf of the kingdom of God, it's not like your voice to the circumstance all of a sudden starts the situation. God has been working before you ever show up. He has been talking before you ever say anything. He's got stuff going on that you have no idea of about and every person you pass on the side of the road there is something going on inside some point of pain or question or concern that they're carrying and oftentimes they are just waiting for someone to give voice to say I want you to know God loves you and he has a plan for you and when we step into something we are actually joining God in what he's already been at work to do all along so Nathaniel was like you know about that You know what I was talking to the Father about under the fig tree? You must be the Messiah. And he opens his heart right there in an instant. And Jesus is like, look, if you're impressed by that, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because we got a lot more we're going to show you. You know, this is something very powerful to understand is this concept that God is already at work before we show up in the world. It's one of my favorite themes. That God is not waiting for us to move to move. He's in your future. He, look, this is really good stuff. He's in 2020 already preparing your future for you. There are things he has got planned for your job situation. And he is already in 2020 getting things set up for you. There are, there are prayers you haven't even prayed yet. And God is in your next year. And he's in your future already preparing things that you haven't even imagined. Look, God is preparing solutions for problems that you don't even know will arise yet. Because God is not the, the God who is somehow now reacting to situations in life. He's a God who's ahead of you. And he's preparing your future for you. And he's got a plan for you, and he wants you to step into what he has in store for your life and your future. But that's not just true for you. That's true for the people that you work with. That's true for the people that haven't yet come to faith yet. That's that's true for the people that you live next to. That's, That's true for the person in your life that you would think, there is no way that person will ever come to Christ. I just can't imagine that their heart is ever going to be open to those kinds of things. But God is at work in situations, and he is talking to people even before you say a word. And, you know, sometimes we have these divine moments. You probably have had these kinds of things happen in your life as well where there is sort of a collision moment where the Holy Spirit lines something up. Um, This is now a long time ago, so I've been pastoring here for many, many years. I know I look really young. Thank you for that. It's just the tan. I was on vacation this week. Okay. But I remember remember one particular Christmas Eve where God just has these set up moments, you know, and uh, Christmas messages, typically you preach out of certain passages, <laughs> you know, Luke chapter two, where it talks about Jesus being born into the world or the angels appearing to the shepherds or Gabriel showing up for Mary in Luke chapter one or Matthew chapter 1, where it talks about Joseph finding out Mary's with child. and So that's normally the themes, okay? Having preached now 29 Christmas Eves, I got the themes. I know where the verses are. And I remember one particular Christmas Eve, the Holy Spirit said to me, preach out of Hosea chapter 2. And I was like, what? Now, not an audible voice, okay? But the Holy Spirit just whispered to me. And as I was reading through, there is this verse in Hosea chapter 2 that says like this, God will make the valley of Achor 
into a doorway of hope. And as I was reading through, the Holy Spirit said, that's your verse. And I was like, Christmas? Are you kidding? How can I preach this on Christmas? Here's what that, he said, the valley of Achor into a door of hope. Well, I had to study a little bit. Achor means trouble. And it was a specific moment in the Old Testament where because of some disobedience that happened, trouble was caused not just for one family, but for the whole nation of Israel. And it was a mess. And Hosea is prophesying, God's going to take your old trouble and he's going to use this as a moment to turn it. And this trouble moment you're in is going to be like a doorway of hope. And someone in our congregation had invited their friends to church. And as they were driving to church that night, they said, you know, this, this whole last year for us has been nothing but trouble. I mean, if we could name this last year a word, we would just say it's just been trouble, trouble, trouble from beginning to end. I hope this next year's better because this year's been nothing but trouble. And then when they sat down and I opened up the Bible and started to preach, Hosea chapter 2, God is going to take the valley of Achor and turn it into a doorway of hope. I noticed them sitting there, tears streaming down their eyes. I had never met them before, but by the end of the service... They were ready to open their life to Christ because it was like I said, I saw you under the fig tree. I I, I heard you, (laughs) not me, the Holy Spirit saying, I heard you when you were in your car. You remember what you were saying? Look, I have been working on your circumstance all along and I've not forgotten you. And I want to take the valley of your trouble and turn it around and make it into a doorway of hope. And, you know, whenever you get involved with somebody in a personal way, you allow for God to talk to somebody in a very personal way that might change their world forever. So here's the first point. Put it back up there again. Number one, God is talking to people before I ever say a word. Here's the second idea, and that's this. My job is not conversion. It's conversation. Look, you're you're not going to save anybody. I don't know if you knew this. You didn't die on the cross for anybody. It's not up to you to convince anybody that Jesus is the Savior and Lord. It's not your job to somehow bring somebody to a decision and then put that notch on your belt to say, look how many people I led to Christ. Look, especially in our world, you know what people are longing for? They don't want pressure. Look, nobody wants religious pressure. But I have discovered that many, many people want to talk about what's going on in their life and about what realities there are about what God is doing in the world and about who Jesus is. And I love how Philip responds to Nathaniel's objections. He just simply says, you don't want to come? Oh, it's all right. Just come see. Just check it out. Come on. Let's just, let's just hang out for a few minutes. Let's just have a conversation. By the way, if you want to be an influence, and this is in any area of your life, whether it's spiritual influence or in other areas, if you want to be an influence, the way you start is not by talking it's by what? Some, some of you missed that part. Yeah, let's try it one more time. The way you become an influence is not by talking. It's by listening. It's just by hearing. So what's going on in your life? You know, what's happening? And then it comes by sharing, adding whatever value you have to the circumstance and having a relationship with somebody and just being authentic about the fact that Jesus is important in my life and he's been a, a major impact on me. And I just want to share that with you in my spiritual journey. So it's just about conversation. By the way, let me just set you up well. The next week, you know, they say 80% of people would come to church if they were just invited, especially during the holidays. And so we have these nine shows called Wonder. We have these on every seat, you know. It's going to be amazing music and a great hot chocolate bar. And we're going to have a jazz trio. And it's going to be something you'll be proud of. It'll be like bringing your... Friends to a show that you'd have to pay money for, except it's free, right? And the whole theme is just all about the goodness of God, the person of Jesus Christ. It's just an easy invite. And then you have at each campus these campus-specific, very family-oriented events that are designed as easy entry points over the Christmas holidays for people who want to experience worship during the Christmas season because that's what Christmas is all about. And it's just a real easy thing to do to say, hey, why don't we just, like Philip said to Nathaniel, come see, let's just check it out. Why don't we just hang out together for a little bit? We'll have some hot chocolate, we'll go to dinner, we'll do whatever. And your invitation might be the beginning parts 
of a journey where someone's life could be impacted and changed. Let's review what we're learning today. Number one, first thing is this. Number one, God is talking to people before I even say a word. You have no idea what he's already involved with in the lives of the people that you're near. Number two, second idea is my job is not convert, conver, excuse me, conversion. It's just conversation. It's just trying to be involved in a way where we can serve. And then the final idea is this. Number three, there is one thing that I can do that no one else can do. And that's what? Ask. Ask. There, there are some people that only you know. There are some people that only would come if you would ask. And so in the journey of being a part of that conversation, your job is just simply to say, okay, God, how do you want me to, to be used during this season of my life? Okay, so let's, let's pray. We're going to close the message. But I want you to close your eyes for a moment wherever you are. And I want us to to realize viral change, you know, something small when shared can change the world, makes a huge impact. I want you to think about now a couple of questions. Who is it in your life that God may be prompting you to invite with you to something going on during the Christmas season? Maybe there is a person who's hurting, struggling, going through something, somebody you work with, someone in your family. Okay, second question would be, what are you going to ask them to be a part of? And then I guess the third was when. When are you going to take that step? And I'd like us to pray right now. If we can, let's pray together. God, we thank you that you love us, that you came on a mission into this world to save us. Thank you, God, that there was someone in our life somewhere who made the invitation for us. And we just pray now that as we go into this holy season of celebration of the coming of Jesus into the world, that you would help us to make the best use of this moment so that we can invite other people to Christ as well. Um, I want you to just do this right now. Can we all pray out loud together? And let's just invite Christ into our life. Just put your hand on your chest right where you are if you want to follow me in this prayer. And would you just pray this out loud? Say, Jesus, I thank you that you came into this world to rescue me from all my past. I thank you, Jesus, that you love me. You have never given up on me. You have a purpose for me. I trust you today with my very soul, and I invite you to do a work in my life. I believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's awesome. We just turn your face toward heaven. Let's just thank the Lord together for a moment. We just thank you, God, for your goodness to us. We bless you. You are so good to us. We worship you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. All right. We're going to prepare to have our giving moment now, and um, I want you to make sure you take home your card, right, as just a reminder of who you're going to think about bringing with you to one of these events. Um, we're going to turn it over to our campus pastors and worship leaders as they get ready to close the service today, and as we give together, our worship team is going to lead us in this closing song. Um, don't feel pressure to give anything. If you are new to us, we just are glad you're here. So let's go ahead and give it up for the campuses. We bless you guys. Give it up one more time if you would with them.